But what about the feathered dinosaurs? That's what you're wondering about. This would be one of the feathered dinosaurs here, Zhenyang Long. And uh, it was found in that northeastern part of China, said to be 125 million years old. Notice it does indeed have a long tail. But notice again, the feathers come all the way into the bone and attach by ligaments to the bone. There is no muscle in this tail. All the vertebrae from here out are all linked together so we would form a solid rod and it would all sort of behave like uh, something solid that bent down at the base, like, like this, not bent along its length, but just from the base. Those were the only movable vertebrae and we can see those movable vertebrae right in this region. The rest is a stick. So this is just like Archaeopteryx. Uh, other people, this guy says that Archae or that uh, Velociraptor, he wants to put it on the on the, the bird side, which of course means that Sinosauropteryx uh, and I, I think Sinonithosaurus would also be on the the. We put that on the dinosaur side. He would put it on the bird side. And there's one that I like to use as an example. Well, it, normally we would put Microraptor in the in the dinosaur side, he wants to put it on the bird side, but there's Caudipteryx zooey. If you use the conventional classification, then you come to Caudipteryx, and now people can't say, is it a bird, is it a dinosaur? If you're going to weigh those as two different categories, which one does this belong to? Even the experts disagree on that position. Where are you on Caudipteryx zooey? Caudipteryx is... Uh a, a member of a lineage called the Oviraptorosaurs. And my current take on this whole group, Oviraptorosaurs, Codipteryx is actually a, a really interesting early Oviraptorosaur. As, as an early member of one of these dinosaur groups, as is typical for them, it's relatively small, it's very bird-like. And over the it's from the early Cretaceous. Over the course of the Cretaceous, Oviraptorosaurs became larger, they uh, became in some ways less bird-like. So it's it's almost like some of these, you know, Oviraptorosaurs, they're part of this Manoraptoran group that I've mentioned a couple of times. It seems that the Manoraptoran group started out as small and bird-like and very samey. And over time, they became, you know, larger and in some respects, less bird-like. So the, the the later Oviraptorosaurs, Oviraptor is the, the most famous one, you know, famously... Uh, found in association with eggs and thought to be an egg stealer and later on found to be looking after its own its own eggs um yeah that, those those large animals from the cretaceous you know they're, they're quite different relative to cordipteryx but cordipteryx is an oviraptorosaur and oviraptorosaurs are not within the bird clade in fact they're outside of paravis which is the group that includes dromaeosaurs Truodontids, which are these long-legged dromaeosaur-like group, and birds. So yeah, Cordipteryx, under current phylogenetic models, is is not is not a bird. It's not on the bird line. When it was first published, which I think was uh, 96 ish, 1996, um, it wasn't immediately obvious to its describers that it was an oviraptorosaur. They just saw the feathers and they thought, wow, this is a, a very bird like manoraptor. And could it be uh, closer to birds than animals like Velociraptor? Whereas now, uh, much more detailed information on its anatomy and a huge number of additional specimens. The number of specimens that they have of some of these animals is amazing. Um, new study has shown it's a uh, yeah, member of the Oviraptorosaur group, but the the feather um, again, the diversity that we see in feather types is is really interesting and and consistent with the rest of our model based on skeletal anatomy because it's not again creationists would like it if you know Cordibrix has feathers, therefore it's a bird. That would be the creationist argument, and. I, again, I'm not going to go on a, off on a tangent here, but as you know, there's even a couple of uh, you know scientists who've argued the same point of view. Most famously, Alan Fiducia, this famous scientist who argues that birds can't be dinosaurs, beloved of creationists, by the way. Um, he says if it's got feathers, then it's got to be a bird. But not only does the distribution of anatomical, you know, bony anatomical features show that's not true, the feathers that are present on these animals aren't all the same. They aren't all exactly the same as those of of modern birds. In fact, you see like five or six major types of feathers 
that seem to match with what we would predict if we came up with a model for feather evolution. It has a long tail, there's no weight to it. And look where the legs go and attach, right here. This would never balance if it didn't walk from its knees. So uh, here you can see the feathers in the wing. I had our artist draw uh, this uh, so-called dromaeosaur, which is generally considered a dinosaur, as a bird. And that would balance, and this certainly looks like a sensacrum up in this area here. That would balance, but if you tried to stand it up so it walked like a dinosaur, bringing the balance point to the hip, it would fall on its nose. So I conclude that dromaeosaurs are birds. What? And that would include velociraptors, dinonychus, and microraptors. <laughs> Hold on now. Back in 2008, when you still thought you could deny all of the feathered dinosaurs except for Archaeopteryx, back when you didn't know that Deinonychus had feathers too, you said then that Deinonychus was clearly a theropod dinosaur. What changed? You said that it couldn't possibly be related to birds because you called it a lizard-hipped, cold-blooded reptile with what you thought was a completely different respiratory system. You didn't know that each of the traits that you thought were uniquely avian applied to every other tetanurin as well as some other types of dinosaurs too. You said then that the fingers of Deinonychus couldn't correlate with the fingers of birds, although that same study also indicates that Archaeopteryx fingers didn't correlate with birds either, yet you're happy to accept Archaeopteryx as a bird, even though it has a lot more in common with other Silurosaurs than it ever had with any bird that ever lived. So tell me, by what hypocrisy did you contradict your former self to overturn and reverse all your own previous exclusions? So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. Wait, what? So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. So when a dinosaur has feathers, that dinosaur becomes a bird. So by your own admission, a bird is just a dinosaur with feathers. You just contradicted your entire presentation by admitting that birds are a subset of dinosaurs. Though I still must point out that not all feathered dinosaurs are birds, but all birds are feathered dinosaurs. You know that some dogs produce not just fur, but wool too, right? When a dog has wool, do you think that makes it a sheep? No, at most it makes it a wolf in sheep's clothing, much like yourself, because in biology, it is the essence of the thing, its constitution that makes it what it is and not its superficial surface features. You're saying that when a dinosaur doesn't have feathers, it's just a dinosaur. But when a dinosaur does have feathers, it's still a dinosaur. When a dinosaur is a ceratopsian or a sauropod, it's just a dinosaur. But when a dinosaur is a maneraptoran, and more specifically a bird, it's still a dinosaur then too. Birds are still dinosaurs, just like ducks are still birds, and mallards are still ducks. You said that birds were all formed to fly, but now you say that velociraptors, oviraptors, and cadifteryx are all birds, even though none of them could fly, and all of them balance from the hip with visible knees, which you said meant that they couldn't be birds at all. Uh, clearly, you were only moving the goalposts in an attempt to mislead your audience, to make them believe in an artificial distinction, which you know does not actually exist. Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry collecting tens of millions of dollars a year from deceived donors trying to defend a belief system that is based entirely on frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies. You have a contractual obligation with them to defend its faith no matter what the truth is. And the contract you signed includes a prohibition such that you cannot knowingly admit what you accidentally just admitted. So how are you going to recover from that fraudulent Freudian slip? And uh, birds are not dinosaurs. Uh, I hope I've convinced you of that. Well, let's uh, close. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 31, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin. Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. That's the biggest understatement in the Bible. The Heavenly Father who sent His Son to suffer all the punishment we should have suffered, even the death of the cross, to pay for our sins, 
He must have valued us a lot. He must have valued us a lot, more than many sparrows. And then in Luke we read that Jesus likes to think of himself as a bird. And guess what kind of bird? A mother hen. Why so? Here he is crying over Jerusalem. So I, I want to I close on this one summary that uh, one of the things that he said was what's so special about birds? Why are they so different, not only from dinosaurs, but from everything else that isn't a bird? Here's a short list about what's unique about birds. And they were uh, the amount of bone fusion, which we, we, we saw from the, uh, from, from the, the pelvis and other things that, that the dinosaurs had the bone fusion as well. Uh, the pneumatic bones, dinosaurs had them as well. That was another thing we didn't cover that, that, that the, the, you know, dinosaur skeleton is entirely hollow, which attaches to the, the air sacs and everything enables them to breed. Uh, the way they walk, which is the same in the Menoraptor and dinosaurs as it is in the early birds as it is in birds in general, an ostrich and emu, they walk, the, actually a chicken, honestly, walks the same as a dinosaur. Just something about the weight distribution on the tail we were talking about. Uh, then the anatomy of their shoulder bones is the same. The anatomy of their hip bones is the same as dinosaurs. The way they breathe is the same as dinosaurs. They have feathers. Well, now we know that's that's not the distinguishing feature that he made it out to be. The one thing that he did say was the way they fly. Now, of course, most people would not classify a uh, uh, microraptor as a bird. They would call that a non-avian dinosaur, you know, despite how, how close it is. I think they misnamed that, by the way. That, that, that animal was predicted 100 years earlier and should have been called by its given name then. Microraptor is a stupid name anyway. They should call it Tetraptrix. Yep. Um the reasons for you know why things have the names they do is often due to the specific nuances of who named it and when microraptor was named it was it was named for a very incomplete specimen that didn't have any feathers or anything it was a rather uninventive name just given to what was thought to be a small member of the the dromaeosaur group they didn't, they didn't know that it had the the four winged configuration so they yeah. the name just out of the uh, just out of the importance of that <laughs> I mean, they did yes. it with Zoglodon, right? With which animal? Zoglodon. Yeah. Um, well, no, the name Bacillosaurus is, is older than, than than Zoglodon. So Zoglodon has never really... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so yeah, the... At some point, they tried to call it Zoglodon. <laughs> it, it, it got into popular books and such, didn't it? But... Yep. Um, Yes. So again, once you look at the that part of the family tree where you've got Microraptor and other dromaeosaurs and early birds like Archaeopteryx and their relatives, you seem to have several different experiments with with flight, with gliding. We know that there's this other group of Manoraptorans called the Scansoriopterygids, which have membranous wings. So it seems that uh, in within Manoraptoran history, you've got this this bunch of lineages. They're all about the same body size, about the same size as a feral pigeon. They've got fairly long forelimbs. They've reduced the tail. They've already got feathers. They've evolved feathers, presumably for both thermoregulation and perhaps for display as well, which explains why they have big feathers on the forelimbs and on the tail. And they've... Another explanation that, I, that I, I haven't read, but I quite like. You, you've seen the fossil of, of oviraptors sitting on the, 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 the clutch of eggs, sitting exactly the way a chicken would sit on its eggs. Well, the arms are draped over this clutch of eggs. Now, because of the type of short wings that those would have had, which wouldn't have been usable as wings at all, they would have been able to better insulate a larger clutch of eggs, which shows a very strong selective pressure to develop those and keep them. Yep, yep, that, that idea has been published uh, as well, the idea that the forelimb feathers did have a role in incubation. Um, but that wouldn't, the, the earliest group that have got feathers in theropods you remember we, us talking about Sinosauropteryx, that's, that's a relative of Compsognathus. They've got relatively short forelimbs, and yet they become covered in feathers, you know, relatively early within uh, theropod history. So is it that the feathers are there for, uh, like, because I, I don't think those animals were spreading their arms around uh, their clutch. I, th I think they would have sat on a clutch, but, um, well, actually, no, I don't think so. I think at that point in history, they're probably putting... Um, uh, rotting vegetation in, in a pile 
over over the eggs. So I don't I don't yeah I'm not a fan of the idea that uh, incubation was uh, an important pressure for feather evolution. I think it was I think it was both temperature control and uh, visual display. But um, creationists will say that there's no use for half a wing, and we've got a, ha a half a dozen uses for half a wing. It, it you know, doesn't have to be flying. And, and another thing that Menton like completely ignored, didn't bring up at all, was one of the things that made Archaeopteryx so important, and which also refutes his own classification of you know trying to distinguish the birds and dinosaurs was the fingers. I mean, what was it about Archaeopteryx that made it transition was not just that it was a dinosaur with feathers. It was that, it, you know, Darwin had predicted this thing two years earlier when he said that the bird's wings were fused fingers. If if birds had, to, had evolved from dinosaurs, then what we should expect to find were unfused wing fingers in some other fossil, right? And what, that's exactly what Archaeopteryx was. That's what Velociraptor is. That's what... The, Things that everybody accepts as birds, like Confucius Ornus, that has the unfused wing fingers with the with the hook claws and everything. So I, the guy's just trying to make excuses so that he can believe in a fairy tale. That's what <laughs> he's paid to lie to people, to misrepresent the facts however he can to make you believe, even if he has to be overtly dishonest to do it. 